Dougald Hein, welcome aboard. Good to be here, Gordon. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to having this discussion. I'm trialing something ultra new and a bit too annoyingly trendy uh, at the moment when I introduce guests. And what I do is I ask ChatGPT for their biography. And I don't know if you've ChatGPT'd yourself, but uh, it hasn't got any of the new information because as it will free, it, it'll tell you, like, I don't know anything that happened after 2021. Boy, do I have some exciting news for ChatGPT. But um, I'm going to give this a shot. I think this is pretty good. All right. So Dougald Hine is a British writer, social entrepreneur, and thinker known for co-founding various interdisciplinary organizations and initiatives. Born in Scotland and later moving to England, Hine studied at the University of Cambridge, where he earned a degree in social and political sciences. He began his career in journalism, working for publications such as The Times and the BBC. In 2009, he and Paul Kingsnorth co-founded The Dark Mountain Project, a cultural and artistic movement examining the implications of current ecological and social crisis. Crises. This project grew into a global network of writers, artists, and thinkers challenging prevailing cultural narratives about progress and human centrality. That's pretty good for an AI. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was going to say, from about 2009 onwards, it's uh, it's pretty on the ball. So, nothing about where you <laughs> live. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, well, correct, correct the robot for us. This is sort of what we're talking about. Oh well, I grew up in the in the northeast of England, okay. but I do have some Scottish ancestry, so that's where that bit comes from. Um, I don't think I ever wrote anything for the Times, but I was a BBC journalist for a short period of time before I realised that I did not want to spend the rest of my life in that way of telling stories, mm -hmm. and so I you know went looking for some other ways of doing that and uh yeah trying to make things happen with stories rather than just um be part of an industrial extractive process which is what the newsroom started to feel like you know it's funny for people listening to this uh given the topic of conversation for this week's show we are having a ruinous experience with technology but we were getting to the point of saying G chat gpt has not uh, has not done a particularly good job of your biography Dougal. so you're gonna have to answer the traditional first question were you a weird kid uh well gordon i think i was bound to be a weird kid because i spent nearly the first three years of my life living in a converted boat shed at the back of a theological college in cambridge and so we were, my dad was training for the ministry and we were living in this tiny sort of two room cottage, but like, as soon as I could toddle around, I could run out of that front door and it was grass and gardens and grown ups who all knew who I was and my parents knew them. And so in some sense, I had the closest thing you could get being born in the 1970s in the West to a village early childhood. And then just before I turned three, I, he'd done his training. We went off to, to Leeds and then we moved on from there to a town in the northeast of England where I did most of my growing up. And so I think I was kind of shaped by that garden. Oh, wow. Those yeah, okay. early memories. <laughs> so uh, maybe I'm still um, the product of, of that, but also growing up around churches. Um, in a time where that was becoming slightly eccentric. And, you know, my dad was kind of that generation who were ministering to the last cohort of folks for whom there was still a lived memory of the church as just part of the background fabric mm. of society rather than something kind of weird and countercultural in the way that it shows up now. And... I just took it for granted that I had these sort of two worlds, the kind of school life, and then this other group of friends and people who I was around on Sundays and other points in the week. But in hindsight, I realized that if you grow up sort of with those words and that language running in the background and the things that you're saying every week, um, it kind of sets you up with this idea that, you know, mundane secular reality is not all there is the the world doesn't have to be as it is just now you know if you're saying i thy kingdom come 
on earth as it is in heaven, you're operating with this cosmology in which there is the possibility that the world could be quite different to how it is right now. And maybe that's how I ended up spending so much of my life around activists and people mm. who were engaged in one way or another with wanting to change the world or get involved in how the world changes was just that kind of taken for granted background hum of prophetic language that was there all the way through my childhood. Do you think that was your father's pull to ministry or was it something different for him? And, and I guess the reason I ask is because uh, for people with a background in, let's say, environmentalism, because we're going to play fast and loose with some terms later on in the show, um, there, there is a strong current of conservatism in in environmentalism. It's this notion of trying to retain a certain amount of parts per million of carbon dioxide at about 1850. There's this, it's it's a looking backwards. It's it's yeah. literally conserving the British Conservation Society. Like by definition, it's it's a conservative act. But you framed that, and I liked it. That there's a there's a pull. There's a future pull towards prophecy, uh, a utopian pull as well. So, do you think like what was it for your father in ministry? Was it a utopian pull? Was it a conservative thing? Were, were you did you inherit a story shape as well as that idea? I think um, for my dad, it was very pragmatic. I remember having this conversation with him one time where he's like, you know, I wouldn't do this if it didn't work. Um, okay. I like that. Where the definition of work has a lot to do with the kind of grassroots um, fabric of community, and uh, I mean his like his big theological hero is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, so that's like you know theology that makes you stand up against Nazis mm. and choose not to leave the country when you had an option of getting out because you've got work to do on the ground and you end up getting killed by them. So I, on the one hand, that's like big, powerful story of what the role of this stuff could be in the middle of the kind of one of the messy bits of the 20th century. And on the other hand, there's just this very kind of mundane, everyday thing that, you know, I've talked to Martin Shaw about this over time because he also grew up with a dad who was uh, a pastor in a church and I... I think we both had this recognition as we got into the work that we've sort of spent our grown up lives doing on the one hand of there being a kind of strange cross generational resonance with what our dads did. Mm. And on the other hand, like when people get all sort of shiny about the things that are happening when you have a bunch of people together at a dark mountain festival or, you know, Martin's telling stories to a tent full of hundreds of people or whatever. And it creates these sort of mountaintop experiences going, well, yeah, you know, that's sort of the easy bit. I actually, the kind of the everyday being the person who goes around and you know, visits people who are sick or old and lonely and just dealing with ordinary human crises in community. That's the hard work of what uh, institutional religion on a good day has been doing. And that doesn't get replaced by us being really good at creating mountaintop experiences at festivals. Like that's kind yeah. of the easy bit. Yeah, like that. We all end up, I mean, you just, you can look at anyone's parents' career for males, typically fathers and, and see some kind of resonance. My father's retired now, but he was a psychiatrist. And I look at what I do and go, yeah, it, that's in there. <laughs> that's definitely in you know, there. Um, psychedelic the theory of mind. Analysis guys have this thing of you end up doing the thing that the same sex parent does in the manner of the opposite sex parent. I don't know if that rings true to you, Gordon. Oh, well, my mother is an energy healer, so I did exactly that. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I certainly learned something new, uh, but I, I'm, I'm interested in that. And I'm interested in the, obviously, because that's what we're going to be talking about, the power of story and and when stories come to an end and what happens when they come to an end, right? Because if, if we, th Martin is a good example. He's been on the show recently and we, 
some of us run from our fathers for longer than others, and, and he's embarking on a Christian journey of his own now. Obviously, famously, Paul has in the last few years as well. There's something, there is something to it. There is something to the reason that's happening. And and it's it's moving into other stories, that's for sure. And I think it's different, as far as I can tell, across different people. But it, that's what I want to explore here is this, uh, is what happens when stories end, I suppose. But before we get mm-hmm. there, this is interesting to me because if your father, if that's one of the things that is still alive for you in your childhood, you had options in terms of schooling and you did pick initially a journalistic career. Do you tell the self, do you tell yourself the story that that's because of your interest in the power of stories? Does that make sense? Did you pick, did you intend to pick story as some sort of life arc, I suppose? Well, I guess I I went to university to do politics, philosophy, and economics, and I lasted two weeks because mm. everyone around me was so straight and ambitious and I canny so, in a very so worldly way. For our majority American audience, the PPE is a establishment dog whistle. You do a PPE, you end up an MP and and so on. So that's what Dougal's talking about there. He yeah. lasted two weeks in the British establishment track. And then I defected to English literature because that gang just looked more fun. And, nice. uh, and I had the luck to be taught by a very weird combination of people. On the one hand, I had a, a poet called Craig Rain who was... Um, a, the least like me in lots of ways writer apart from the fact that we'd both come from the same part of the northeast of england and so he had this sort of curiosity about me because of that and he was also an amazing editor he wasn't a real academic at all he was kind of uh playing around in the corner of oxford university but he was an extraordinary editor and like just great detail for uh, like the words and the sentences and so i learned a lot from him and then I was taught by a guy called Tony Nuttall, A.D. Nuttall, who you might have come across at some point, Gordon, because he was really interested in like the esoteric and Gnostic currents within the history of English literature. And I, he wrote books that were tracing these kind of big under the surface lineages of literature as thinking um, from Shakespeare and Milton and Blake and so on. The name so, rings a Distant bell, but I, not certainly not off the top of my head, that's for sure. But anyway, carry on. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, so, so it was a very weird, wandering, expansive sort of three years of exploring English literature without being a particularly diligent student. Um, and I think the, the big moment within it for me, though, was studying medieval literature and having this kind of experience of suddenly stumbling into a world with a totally different understanding of causality. Like reading these texts and going, oh, wow, it doesn't occur to anyone. It doesn't occur to the guy writing this that anyone would ever ask, yeah, but like, what's really going on? Like, what's the real cause that Crusade gets leprosy in Henderson's Testament of Cressid, which is this middle Scots poem that I had this kind of uh, epiphany while I was writing a, an essay on. And there's just like this whole stack of causality from the humors and the landscape and uh, like the sexual behavior of the character all the way up to the astrology and the gods having a council of the gods that happen also to be the planet and then a Christian god sitting somewhere at the top of the stack. And I would say it was like if you'd grown up in a culture where the only kind of music was unaccompanied solo melodic song. And then one day you stumble through an archway into a room and there's people singing like a 12 part motet. That was sort of the experience that I had with this literature that was old enough that it was coming from a world which just uh, was so different. I think you can have the same experience if you study anthropology or something. It's Mm -hmm. like over the years, I, I got very into Ivan Illich and he had this thing of you know, the mirror of the past, that you look into the mirror of the past, and as you let your eyes adjust to the strangeness of things people are taking for granted there, it begins to show you the strangeness of things that you have been taking for granted where you are. 
So I was already onto all of these tracks while I was an undergraduate. And I used to go off and do this crazy summer job selling books door to door to sort of pay for being able to keep up with the lifestyle of my friends who came from very different families and backgrounds to me, which right. got me into all sorts of sort of new thought stuff, because that was part of the sales culture of the company that I was working with. And also bought me a bit of time after I graduated because I could work for three months and make some money and then go like I went off and spent six months living in Cape Town and I was meant to be writing a book, but I was 23 and I oh, didn't. Oh, right. I've done that. That was New Zealand yeah. for me. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go <laughs> write the, the great something novel. Yeah, exactly. Not yet. <laughs> but that was how I stumbled into journalism was I was just looking in there, like coming back after a year of totally failing to write a book. Going, well, I can't go on knocking on doors saying I'm a student doing a crazy summer job selling books for much longer. I went and did a journalism course and rolled straight out into a BBC newsroom. And uh, after about six months where it felt really cool when you were at a party and someone asks what you do, and instead of saying I'm a student, you get to say, oh, I work for the BBC. Mm -hmm. Like the reality of the kind of industrial news production machine began to impinge. and. Uh, I had a day, this is, this is fun. I had a day when I was basically offered a clear run at a staff job at the BBC by the, the managing editor of the station I was working at. I, he told me who else was gonna be put up for it. It was internal candidates only. I was the only one with the qualifications and the experience. 12 hours later, I'm leaving the station, last person to lock up at night, having been doing a story about uh, UFOs and ghosts and my phone rings and it's my oldest friend saying, you know how you always said that if the spare room in our flat came up, we should give you first refusal. Well, my, uh, my housemate's done a bunk and she's not been paying the rent and the landlord's going to kick us out if we don't find someone else. Do you want to move to London? And so I was literally presented within 12 hours of yeah. these two choices, like secure career position at the BBC move to London and live with my best friend. And uh, that was kind of the fork in the road where I took the, the path that didn't make sense to my friend's parents and my parents' friends and then had to work out what I was going to do with my life instead. No, I like that. That's really good. The, uh, it is an absurd place, isn't it? So I was in BBC Worldwide, which was described to me on my first day as the pirates to the BBC's Navy, which has right. taken on more intense terms now that it's just naked imperial propaganda. But on my first day, this is what we had to deal with because I was in BBC magazines. Uh, the BBC Wildlife magazine manager had accepted a back page ad for a, from a charity that is anti-seal clubbing. And we had a 90 minute meeting about whether we could take this ad because we might not be serving BBC license payers who are pro seal clubbing. And that was my first day. And we ended up not taking the ad because we might have upset for people who are unaware. It's this, uh, the ideology of the BBC is this fake notion of impartiality, which is essentially attempting not to take a position, but it, that makes it the establishment position by definition. And we, we just had this long meeting about, uh, we couldn't take a seal club, an anti-seal clubbing charity ad for BBC Wildlife magazine because there might be readers who are pro-seal clubbing. Readers of BBC Wildlife magazine <laughs> pro-seal clubbing. And that was on my first day. And I'm like, this, this is an absurd place. <laughs> this is not where I'm going to spend much time. Nice one. So after BBC, well, no, let's do better than that. Uh, there would have been, at, at what point do you get, tell us the story of how you get into starting something like the Dark Mountain Project. Because at the moment we have a young guy who has some unconscious, let's say thinking capacities. They're like, no, I'm going to, I'm following something irrational. And I mean that in a good sense. I'm following something irrational. Something's going on here. There's something else happening. That's still a big jump to the Dark Mountain Project. So yep. if we, when we start talking about story and ideology and worldview and so on, tell us about descending into this one. 
Well, I guess I'd always had, on the one hand, a sort of um, maybe an apocalyptic sensibility, just a sense of living at the end of something, a sense of just looking around and at a gut level going, this isn't going to hold together that much longer. Um, and, you know, nurtured on the one hand by that, you know, that kind of prophetic backdrop of childhood. And on the other hand, these kind of experiences of medieval literature and other things I started to stumble into a sense of, and even when it worked, there was something messed up about mm -hmm. this as viewed from the perspective of the ways that humans have made life work in other times and places. So like on the one hand, you know, we seem to be at the end of this project of modernity or whatever we want to call it. And on the other hand, like even when it was delivering the goods for a bunch of people, there was something fucked up about this project anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so, and then like lots of people who have been kind of brought up with lots of the assumptions of modernity sort of permeating us, it's like the place where you're given permission to experience that sense of endings is climate change yeah, because okay. it's where the scientists are delivering the like the, the the heavy message of you know it's all it's all falling apart it's all you know we're in terrible trouble and you might be feeling that from a dozen other directions but that's the direction where it's getting the stamp of authority from you know the people who are at least officially meant to be the ones who get to tell us what is real around here. Mm. So, well, I, yeah, so that was kind of, that was the journey I was on when I met Paul. Yeah, I like that because, and I think you're right to say that that's where you can go to experience that feeling of Old Testament prophecy, right? In in a sanctioned sense, that's, that's alive for me. That's a really resonant way of saying it. Because if you don't, operate in um, smaller cultures or, or other life ways where, I mean, you can join a really crazy church and, and get it there. Right. But if you are operating in, in a, in a reality that matches most of the other people you're meeting on a daily basis, that's where you will go to find it. I think that's really, that's cool. That's a, a good way of given where we go with this conversation. Cause I do want to talk about modernity in a moment. Uh, so for people who there would be surprising given the show, but, uh, describe what the dark mountain project was or is but like do you know what i mean describe yeah. tell us that well, story it started with me and paul crossing paths because we were reading each other's blogs basically around 2007 i had made my definitive break with the bbc about a year earlier and he put up this post that was like i resign and he'd basically been kind of freelance journalist, one of the best known environmental journalists in Britain. And it's like, when you're a freelancer and you've reached the end of your tether, how do you, where do you even address your resignation letter? So he puts it on his blog. And at the end of it, he's like, but I have an idea for this publication that I'd like to create. And he just said a few lines about it. And there was something in it I, on the one hand, I really resonated with him having reached the end of his tether with journalism because I got there, you know, sooner um, for similar reasons. And on the other hand, there was something tantalizing in what he said. And he said, you know, and if I'm going to make this happen, I'm going to need, you know, people of goodwill who are willing to get involved. And I said, I'm going to write to him. And uh about three months later, he put up another thing. And this time it was specifically about climate change. It was like when there was a COP meeting on and all of his other environmentalist friends were really like steam coming out of their ears about their latest negotiations and weakness of agreements. And he was like, I've reached this place where I've just let go. I, I no longer believe that I don't think he put it quite this way, but this is sort of the language we ended up coming up with together. I no longer believe that the world is the kind of thing that needs saving, and certainly yeah. not by the people who get together at those big international meetings. And I think we're just going to have to ride this thing that is coming down the pipeline, this wave that is coming towards us. And he said, and the weird thing is, I'm feeling more hopeful and alive and creative than I have been in ages since I let go of, you know, pretending 
And this was one of the, the things we started to talk about a lot in the early years of Dark Mountain. It's like, what happens when you stop pretending yeah. that the world is the kind of thing that needs or saving or can be saved by a bunch of people who get together in those kinds of rooms? And, you know, also, so we wrote this manifesto together, which was like about the myths of progress and of human separation from nature and of civilization and just everything that has to be written out of the story in order to make those logics around which modern societies have been shaped work and sound convincing. And part of that was saying, you know, we are in trouble. We're in really deep trouble. And actually lots of environmentalism involves I, running around, busying yourself with forms of activity that are ways of distracting yourself from what you know in your chest when you're awake in the middle of the night. And we are saying like, it's time to just stop and look down and actually I make rooms where it's possible to bring those fears and doubts and darknesses without being judged for it and without being on your own with it and without assuming that despair is a thing to be avoided at all costs and without assuming that despair is the end of the road. Like sometimes despair is just a passage that you have to go through. Like you have to make that journey through the underworld. And the other bit of it was because we were talking about these myths and stories and saying like, we're in this trouble, not just because of a piece of bad luck with the atmospheric chemistry, but because of a way of approaching the world, a way of seeing and treating everyone and everything. And if that's the case, then those of us who work with culture, you know, storytellers, poets, artists, culture makers, like maybe we have to politely decline the role in which we're usually invited to show up when people are doing projects where they want to ask us to get involved with something around climate change, because that role is always to deliver the message, to be like the chief yeah. alternative to the advertising agency. And so instead to go like, if we're in this trouble because of a set of stories that our culture likes to tell itself, and if we're running out of road to try and live by those stories, then we might have a role to play in unearthing other stories, showing the possibility that, there, that it's possible to live by other stories than the ones that got us here. And so that was sort of basically the stuff we laid out in about 20 pages in the manifesto and spent a couple of years having fights with people like George Monbiot and then gradually um, a bunch of other Never people started to find their way to us. <laughs> Yeah, never a waste of time. He's even more <laughs> insane now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. All right. So that was the beginning of. It's a difficult thing to. It's like mixed media collaborative event performance. Uh, it's what I like about the Dark Mountain Project. Firstly, is its very metal name, uh, and it brings to mind witches gathering on hilltops that kind of thing it, it it has a the right energy the right ominous like ominous feel to it uh, a potentious energy because i think dark mountain i think witches covens hilltop it, it did a very good job of warding off the new age people as well that's true <laughs> that's true uh and so i'm not sure how else to characterize it other than you, you, you can say things like it's a series of publications and events and it's the collaborations and, and what have you but it's it is its own kind of thing, which uh, which is very appealing, and and because it is portentous, I think it's a weird way of saying it. But just as moving through despair, I think people need to pass through a dark mountain project. To, like I think that actually yeah, yeah. needs to happen. I think you need to climb that mountain, join that sabbat for a while, however you want to describe that. It's that same idea. Like the you have to. Uh, this is a, a really weird a person to quote at this point, but one of the sharks on the American version of Shark Tank, I think his name's Matt Higgins, but his kind of watchwords are face everything. Hmm. You have to face everything at some point. And, uh, and that I quite like. I like the, the metaphor, the, the literal image of, of a dark mountain for that. That's always, it was always so potent for me in that respect. But does that, does that make sense? As a, yeah, I think yeah. everyone needs to, yeah. I, I mean, I always came to think of it as like the mountain is a place of retreat. 
in both the military and the spiritual senses of the word. It's like when the story you were attempting to have agency from within is no longer making sense to you, you can stick around there going through the motions or you can withdraw for a while and go somewhere where you get a longer view. And like the temptation when you get to that space, we used to have this with our festivals, is like after a couple of days, this extraordinary energy is being built up because we're in this kind of sacred space. And then someone will go, right, we need to have a session where we talk about what we're going to do. Yeah. And my role was always to be the one who was kind of holding the big stick and saying, no, there is no we yeah. here that can do. The thing you're experiencing here is precisely because we've moved to another state, which is what you needed, which is why you found your way here, like why you responded to the weird invitation we made. And then your job is to go back down the mountain and see which bits of this still make sense when you find your way to your everyday and which of the connections you made here turn out to be useful. And lots of stuff will happen from that. But if we sit around and try and hold a council and come up with a plan for a new movement, no, like that's a failure to read the the space that we're in. Yeah, that's it is the thinking that gets us into the mess we're in anyway. The the yeah. uh, managerial solutionism, right? So I I couldn't agree more. That, that it's a far more indigenous way of uh, being with the moment and that allowing that to change the field. You know. Uh, yeah. So next question. This, well, uh, the next two questions, I'm going to leave it up to you which one to answer first, and I think it'll make sense as to why. So the book we're talking about, for people watching, At Work in the Ruins, amazing title, and I want to unpack both the word uh, work and ruins uh, in this title, uh, because it's they're both huge, given the, and even bigger than the the content in the book, like the title alone is an invitation to sit with the, the, the fullest implications of what you're talking about. So that's question one. Do we start with the title and work and ruins? Or do you want to tell us the story about the moment or the day you decided to stop talking about climate change? Because we're going to do both. But which one is going to be uh, lyrically the best to start with? Let's start with the story, because there's a bit of the story that only came into focus for me recently. In fact, yesterday I was talking to a mutual friend of ours, Jay Springett, and uh, he's just read Vanessa Machado de Oliveira's book, Hospicing Modernity. Huh. And See, we haven't spoken about that yet, but I only heard about that book through you, and that's where we're going to get to. Carry on, carry on. <laughs> right. So, so basically, there were two things that happened, both of which are Vanessa's fault, in September 2021. Um, so the first thing was that she asked me to voice the audiobook of that. And I said to her, Vanessa, there is no publisher in the world right now that would think of asking a white English dude to voice a book by a woman of color from the global south. And she was like, yeah, but I trust you with my words and I don't want it to be pigeonholed. And so I basically spent three weeks every afternoon going into the studio under the stairs in the big red Swedish barn that we have at the bottom of our garden because it's the quietest place on the property and bringing every single word of that book through my body into a microphone on my own. And it was Jay who said this to me yesterday. He said, you realize you're the only person in the world who has read every word of that book aloud. And you realize yeah. that was the ritual. And so basically I did that for three weeks and that summoned the book that I had been failing to write for 30 years. So that's where this book comes from. And then the other part of the story, which gets us to stopping talking about climate change is I'd been introduced to this weird character, Felix Marcard, who describes himself as a recovering Davos junkie. And um, he basically used to be part of that whole world around the World Economic Forum. And he also used to be addicted to various substances. And he says, you know, he went into recovery for um, one thing and then another. And, and at the beginning, he had this kind of sense of pride of, well, I was a really high functioning addict because I was doing all of this high flying stuff while I was sticking all this stuff up my nose. And then at a certain point, he said it dawned on him, no, that whole world was his addiction. Mm. And everyone in that world is addicted to power and to this way of being. And he started to get turned on to various people's work. I think it started with like 
the Land Institute and Wendell Berry. And then somehow he found his way from there to Vanessa's work. And Vanessa and I had been in Paris with Bio Akumalafe in 2018, right in the middle of the Yellow Vest protests. And we'd been at this weird thing called the Plurality University. And I was like, well, anything that's setting itself up in antagonism to the Singularity University has got my interest. And there was a kind of sense of world of many worlds to it. And on stage there, I'd said something like, if we really took seriously the trouble we're in, what we'd be looking for is not all of these techno solutions. We'd be looking for something like AA, but on the scale of cultures rather than the scale of individuals, because this addiction is not something that can be addressed at the level of the individual. And so then I get this voicemail from Vanessa saying, you have to meet this guy, Felix, because he's saying something really similar. And he's been in recovery for a few years. And so we started talking and we ended up talking pretty regularly. And it was on one of those calls in September 2021 that I heard myself say, I think I need to stop talking about climate change. And like as the words came out of my mouth, I was like, and I should probably just write something explaining why. And Philip's like, yes, yes, you really need to write that. And I mean, the short version of why is because for a long time, kind of in the way that I described in my own experience, I had people coming to me for whom climate change was like the point where the veneer cracked, like the point where they realized that, you know, we're not dealing with some minor issues that need to be tweaked. We're dealing with a ship that's going down and it's not going down just because of climate change, but climate change because of its stamp of scientific authority is the place where lots of kind of mainstream people who have been pretty sheltered from the shadow side of what modernity has been wreaking in the world. It's the place where they reach their dark night of the soul. And so, you know, then you get to this place where it becomes the kind of the powerful information that is calling people into question and leading them into a sort of initiatory state a state of having all of their stories, all of their ideas of themselves called into question, into a kind of place of liminality. And, you know, in order to go there or in order to make sense of that experience, you have to be able to treat, you have to be able to, you know, use the bit of the story that science is telling you about climate change, but not have that defined as the whole of the story. Right? There are questions that climate change asks us, which science cannot answer. And I'd been saying that for years and that had been like taking us to some really fruitful places, but suddenly between the kind of the language of the climate movements that began in 2018, 19, where it was like placards with unite behind the science. And then the complete kind of electrification of an intensification of the science as an object of overriding political authority and of belief in 2020, I was like, it doesn't work anymore. Like you can't have a conversation that starts from this place that is determined mm -hmm. by the frame of the science and hope to go somewhere else because in official reality, there's no longer room for a somewhere else beyond the science. The science has become the thing we're meant to be following, the thing we're meant to be uniting behind. And never mind that that has very little to do with you know, what working scientists actually think science is yeah. but well, that, yeah yeah so that that was that was my kind of uh, it's time to stop talking about it it's time to start the conversation somewhere else moment yeah that's cool so uh for me i'm obviously naturally more suspicious i i mm. came to my own realization of i'm utterly disinterested i write in my book that i'm a client climate denier in the sense that climate exists as a function of scientific models, which is a product of materialist naturalism. So I like saying I'm a climate denier in that respect, but my journey out of the concern there was seeing it hoovered up. I began as a kid with, when the Greenpeace stick is still said, think global, act local. And the Green Party down here in Tasmania, it was where Australia's Green Party started, began with a dentist, a gay dentist on a canoe trip on a river that they were about to dam. And he's like, I don't think we should dam this place. And he won, <laughs> right? So um, that kind of stuff 
works and is enriching to the person and to the cosmos. And over the decades, the same thing happened with permaculture. It got hoovered up away from think global, act local into obey global, local is irrelevant. And everything became climate alarmism, frankly, because mm -hmm. it started as like they keep having to change the words and yell louder because it doesn't work. As you say, yeah. you have to get louder and louder with it because it's not working. This is something Charles Eisenstein identifies, which is if you try to scare people into change, it doesn't work and then you have to get scarier. Why don't we try a revolution of love rather than a revolution of fear, right? And so that was it for me, a similar thing, but a few years before where I'm like, this is the same fucking materialist naturalist scam as everything else. This has been colonized by the language of power mm. and is being used as such. So like I, everything you just said, yes. And I, I, <laughs> I pull mine back like, five, six years, because that's the moment when you realize you've used, you quote Paul in the book, science is an ideology posing as a method. It sure as shit is now. It's a tyrannical one at that, you know? Yeah. And it's like the, the trouble in the end for me was that it's like you are, you're out for a walk and you come to a fork in the road and there's a signpost and written on both arms of the signpost is the same thing, taking climate change seriously. But they're pointing in such diametrically yes. opposite directions <laughs> that they're hiding yeah. the choice. They're hiding what's at stake. And so whatever yeah. else there is to say, it's just like what Bill Gates means when he talks about taking climate change seriously is so different to the people who Correct. I've worked with over the years. And... I know where the power lies, so I know who's going to get to dominate what those words mean. So I have to go and find other language. Yeah. So um, this is one of the ruins. So when we, we get back to talking about the title, because I love it. But I have to ask this. I'm not sure if you've been asked this yet since the book's come out. But if you write a book about essentially why you're going to stop talking about climate change, something you've been doing for some time beforehand, is that not just going to get you in conversations like this one? Climate <laughs> <laughs> change. Uh, it is, there is a risk, right? I, um, I'm, I'm looking at what I'm going to write the next book about, and it's definitely not going to be. It's not going to have any climate change in it. And uh, you need to declare that you're not going to talk about sex and puppies anymore. <laughs> That's. <it. laughs> I'm done. Uh, that sounds like a good pitch. Yeah. I uh, I mean, the, literally, the, 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 first, the first draft of the book was called Why I'm No Longer Talking to People About Climate Change. And everybody said, for multiple reasons, you cannot call it that. But um, it, I'm much happier with the title we ended up with because it combines these two things, which is, on the one hand, you know, just naming the ruins, going like, this is not a... Because, you know, so often the kind of the pitch around climate change and environmentalism and so on is if we don't do X, then we're going to end up Y yeah. and Y is, is ruins. And it's like, no, the ruins are already here. Um, you know, I, I really like, there's a, a book by a pair of anthropologists, Marisol de la Cadena and Mario Blazer called a world of many worlds. And in the introduction to that, they go, you know, this whole Anthropocene conversation, that's kind of going on in cities like Berlin and London and New York. Do you know how that sounds from elsewhere? It sounds like the world of the powerful waking up to the possibility that its world too could end after 500 years of going around the world, ending everyone else's worlds and calling that progress. Yep. And again, it's this image of the fork in the road because they're like two things can happen when that moment of, you know, waking up to the precarity and to being at the end of your world comes. One path leads to this kind of humbling encounter where you can finally hear the things that people have been trying to tell you for generations. And that's where like Vanessa's book, you know, Hospicing Modernity Stuff and so on goes. Um, the other path is it becomes the, the, the sort of source of legitimation for a final desperate more extreme than ever attempt of the project of managing and controlling the world from the same places. And that's kind of, you know, yeah, that's what I'm trying to just turn things away from in the book, really. Yeah. Well, because that's what we've experienced the last several years. This is the, the final, and that's exactly right. And it comes back to what you said at the beginning of the show, which is, it's almost like, 
I'm happy a lot of this is happening. It, you're allowed to feel a lot of things. That The world that is coming to an end, I don't like a lot of it, <laughs> you know? No. Um, the process is going to suck. But yeah. the, this, from the outside looking in at the Anthropocene, it is a uh, over-educated histrionic uh, publishing fest that leads to AOC's worldview. Uh, right. it, it leads to Fourth Industrial Revolution World Economic Forum. It's the idea that because technocratic managerialism is failing, we must do more of it. It's it's yeah. biblical. It is it is a Gnostic sin. And that when people write about the Anthropocene, this is I'm glad you uh, referenced Bruno Latour's uh, book because mm. he lost me for about seven or eight years there because he got quite Anthropocene and too insular and French basically. <laughs> uh, but I think he, like, they all sort of work it out together, but he kind of woke up a little bit more in it. But this is what, this is the ruin. The thing that yeah. is 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 ruining is this, how, however you want to define it. I, I, I like a technocratic managerialism or expertiseism because you don't necessarily, that cuts across everything. You don't necessarily have to, put it into our societal categories of education and politics and so on. It is the ideology that the world is improved toward perfection under more and more expert governance. And, yeah. and that's the way <laughs> out of things. And that people mistake that for reality. That is a demented mind virus that is coming apart and we're living in its ruins. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, the most important or like the, the line that stayed with me from what Paul and I wrote in the manifesto, which is the starting point for this book, is the end of the world as we know it is not the end of the world, full stop. Because if we can't make that distinction, we end up defending the world as we know it at all costs, as if that is you know, exactly. a desirable thing to be doing. This is the AOC thing. If you look at what the... Uh, the progressive technocratic uh, hysteria is at the moment, it is attempting to reorganize and destroy basically how humans live everywhere on the planet to keep the system going. That's inherent and sustainable. We're attempting to sustain <laughs> this, yeah. this, this way of life. And that's what's behind windmills and Teslas and the rest of it. Never mind the fact that you drop down to the next level and from a resource and basic physics perspective they don't work that's not the point the point is they're supposed to work so that we can keep how we live going but yeah. that's ending <laughs> that's the ruin you know yeah so so i know, like that i like karen so do you know federico campagna's work at all yeah yeah i that was something that i came across really late on in the writing of this book and i realized that he was talking about ruins as well and he has this great line of thought where he's like, you know, sometimes you're born into the ending of a world. This is a thing that mm -hmm. happens. And uh, the way you know that is that the future doesn't work anymore. Because when you're at the ending of a world, you're at the ending of the arc of that story. And the future in the ordinary sense of the word is a projection from the recent past through the present onwards to offer a kind of vehicle of promise and hope. And so I, we're clearly in a time where that's the case, like all of the political power, whether we like it or not, within the existing games of politics lies with people who are invoking the past. It's like Anthony Barnett yep. said, you know, make America great again, take back control. The most important words are again and back. And when people try and, and stand so up, that Hillary, like in 2016, Hillary had to pivot as well to a looking backwards uh, because she was TPP and the rest of it. And because MAGA was actually working, they had to, it, there's no, there's no forward looking platform anywhere across the spectrum. Like it's not conservative anymore. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. And so Federico's suggestion is like, if, if, if this is your discernment of the times you were born into, then what do you do? Like, firstly, stop worrying so much about needing to make sense according to the logic of the world that is ending yeah. and start secondly start looking for ways to make good ruins because things are going to be left behind from the world that is ending and obviously some of that's like toxic shit that people will be dealing with for twenty thousand years to come but 
it also includes things that people will make new worlds out of from this rubble. So that, that to me, was kind of one of the most helpful takes I found on, oh, on the ruins. Right. Where... I, want to get, I definitely want to get to that because that's the, the work part of ruins. But I, mm. I want to stay with ruins a little bit more because yeah. um, I, when I was still in the UK and I was a member of British Museum member, National Trust, English Heritage, what have you, because I spent all my time in ruins. Mm. And... The there's a particularly British way of doing ruins, uh, where it's manicured lawn right up to the ruin that you must not touch. It's <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's preserving this the relationship to the past, the relationship to the thing that is, that no longer works is really telling, I guess, on a national psyche level. But it led me to think a lot with ruins. It led me to think a lot with uh, what their presence is and that we're always in them for a start. Uh, but there are times when you get special ruins. And for me, one of the things that's kept me in permaculture one way or the other is it's a, when it's done right, which is not that often, uh, it's a methodology of working in the ruins. One of the things Bill Mollison would say when you move onto a property is to look at the on-farm resources that were there. Like there were structures on this place when we bought it. And because the guy who left, I don't want to speak ill or whatever, but there's some stuff he could have cleaned out. Apparently, this is the first property I've ever bought, so I don't know, but apparently everyone does it. Everyone leaves some stuff behind. But I'd never had five acres under management before. So the, this idea of like, well, what is left from the ruin of this guy's life? Where, and, and to build my life in and around and replace stuff as we went forward with it. But we are always in some kind of ruins. <laughs> We're always in it, right? And uh, just coming back to the, the fear of the future moment, mm -hmm. one of the things that I noticed, I've been writing about for about 15 years that supports this, I remember when all the reboots started happening in Hollywood and it was like, what's with all these reboots? And I'm like, oh, that's easy. Uh, writers can't, there's a point beyond which writers can't see. Um, they don't want to see, they, they can't look. And the, the closer we've got to it, which is about now, it's just more and more reboots and reboots and reboots and rebooting Spider-Man while there's still a Spider-Man on in the, in the yeah. cinema. And the same thing happens with culture. So the current Zoomer obsession with the 90s mm -hmm. makes complete sense to me. I mean, we both lived through the 90s. It was fine. <laughs> but uh, but it's this like nostalgic utopian period. No, I get it. Because that was after the so-called end of history when you could kind of be a slacker and the world was sort of going to run in this benign, modern capitalist way forever. And, and you could be a slacker. You could sit around smoking weed and playing, what would that have been then? PlayStation 2, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, could, you could do that. So I absolutely get the Zoomer obsession with the 90s in the same way I get why Hollywood can't do anything new. It's the same event. Like, we are at the end. There, there's nothing no, to look out at. And the weird, the weird thing is that, you know, if you look with a longer view, it starts about 1971, 1972 which is on the one hand when like the French theorists are coalescing into this thing called postmodernism. Like, why does it make sense to talk about being postmodern? Well, to talk about, to, to identify as modern is to see your proximity to the future as the most important and presumably the best thing about your condition. Yeah. And so this talk of postmodernity comes in precisely at the moment where there's a loss of confidence in that, after the failure of the hopes of 68, and as the ecological news from the front lines is beginning to come in about what we're doing to the planet. And meanwhile, in London, because you know the English are less prone to theory, Malcolm McLaren is inventing retro fashion. Like that's a new yeah. thing. And it's also like he first uses the phrase no future that then becomes famous with the pistols in a film about Oxford Street that he makes in 1970. So there's this moment in the kind of backwash, the aftermath of the 60s, where suddenly it's becoming clear that the future is over and the past is being used in a new way. Because if you talk about that ruins thing in terms of the English way of preserving ruins, like part of what's going on there is the sort of the way in which modernity constructs tradition. You know, yeah. modernity constructs tradition as its opposite. 
as this unchanging, timeless thing. Nothing is timeless and unchanging unless it's inside a glass box in a museum with lots of work going into trying to make it not change. Uh, Gustavo Esteva said to me, you know, in Mexico, we have a great tradition of changing our traditions traditionally. That's and lovely. yeah, and that is like recognizing that your culture is always compost. Your culture is always ruins. And the work of culture is always allowing that to happen and intervening in such ways that life emerges among the ruins rather than either trying to stop things getting ruined or trying to preserve that ruin in aspic as the as your other yeah and uh i obsessed on this idea for a good year or so visiting ruins around europe and and britain and i would look at paintings for instance of the grand tour mm. and you'd see people picnicking in the forum in Rome, and there'd be like goats and cows. And I'm thinking, this is so much better. <laughs> it's still in use. You, you get the same thing with like ruined abbeys in Britain. You'll see paintings of people just hanging out. I mean, you know, in fancy clothing, they're still picnicking or whatever, but it's not, uh, it, it's still in the life process. And, and what I came to with that, because I know people are hearing like, yes, but if we kept doing that, then the ruins would have gone away. First of all, maybe, and, and all of them will eventually anyway. But two, if we lived in a society where we still were in relation to our past like that, it wouldn't look like ours, which means it wouldn't automatically be a default antisocial society where you would expect people to graffiti the temple of Jupiter just because you can, because you, you can walk near it, right? And by the way, the Romans did that. So like, come on. <laughs> but I'm I'm really interested in in how people relate to ruins and, and how they understand it. And that's one of the things that was so alive for me in the book. But the other one is like at work in the ruins. Yeah. So why why work? That's the other that's the other point, I guess. Well, it's this sense that there is still stuff to do. Because again, like the subtext to so much of the way that we end up talking about stuff like climate change is, you know, we have this last chance. We have to all do as much as possible. And then if we fail, it's all over. And it's like none of that is like wherever you, wherever you end up on, um, you know, the science of climate change and what it's telling us, that way of framing things does not help anyone you know, because it it's based on a denial of the fact that there are processes already in train which are going to change things dramatically. But it's also, I mean, it's this, this thing of putting all the weight on the shoulders of those of us who happen to be around just now in the next few years, mm, yeah. as if that is either, you know, as if that isn't just reproducing the way that modernity always wants to make us here now, the center of the story and the ones who have all of the agency. And so instead, I got I got very um, into something that I heard Tyson Juncker Porter say, where he's like, you know, if we're really lucky, we're in the early stages of like something that's going to take a thousand years, because that's exactly. how long it takes to have a world of old growth forests again. And what that does is it says there's a role you can play in this story but in order to play that role, you have to first accept that the story will be going on after you, at least in this form, are gone. And that seems to me like a much more helpful way than to place ourselves as either the heroes or the villains, which is the way that I, lots of the mainstream climate narrative invites us to identify and find seek agency. Exactly. And you mentioned Bayo Kumalafe earlier. Mm -hmm. The other thing he would say at this point is that uh, we have to come to an understanding that there are agencies other than human in the world. So we, we make climate change about us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and there are there's lots of other things going on, lots of other lives living and worlds welding. And that's what I quite like about at work in the ruins is there's a there's a right amount of positivity in it, which mm -hmm. is there's still as you say, there's still stuff to do. It's yeah. not, fuck it. <laughs> Let's just see what happens. Yeah. It's, it, if anything, re-empowering because people, and this is one of the other reasons I left the idiotic, totalitarian, technocratic worldview, which is 95% of at least published climate discourse uh, these days, uh, is 
it's disempowering. It, it it actually gives you no work to do except be afraid and I don't know give uh, give money to someone. It's yeah. not how to be in the world. It, th- there are things to do. There there are things to do when you see the ruins. There's there's work to do. Right. Nice one. Yeah. So that brings us to the work that we can do. And obviously, Jay got there before I did. Mm-hmm. Hospicing modernity. You mentioned. Mm-hmm reading that book aloud, which definitely is a ritual, but give us, give us your thoughts on what that means now, having got to the end of the book in, in a, in a really performative way. I don't mean just finishing the book. I mean, having got to the end of speaking the book aloud into the world. Yeah. Cause I, I love that idea. It comes back to something I said earlier, which is I'm so ambivalent in the literal sense of the term of feeling two things quite strongly at once, which is I'm really happy so much of this is going away. I'm really happy about it. But it is also going to suck. And there are some things, even if they're just benign absurdities um, in modernity. The reason I mentioned Bruno Latour is I love his characterization of modernity as essentially a fiction. Like we've never been modern. It is a silly belief system just like anyone else's, which is true. (laughs) But all silly belief systems have cute little absurdities in them for one thing. And I just love this idea. It gives us work to do mm-hmm. uh, to hospice modernity, but it also invites like, well, what are the things we are, I don't want to say trying to save for as long as possible, but what are the things that we are attending to in a hospice sense? So how are you with that book and that idea at the moment these days? Yeah. I mean, the first time I heard Vanessa talk about that, it just, mapped so closely onto things that I'd been trying to say for years. Um, because like, for me, the the hospicing modernity is not trying to save it, not trying to kill it, and not trying to rush into what's coming afterwards. Perfect. Trying to give it a good ending, both in the sense of a, limiting the damage, frankly, um, and also in the sense of letting it teach us the things that maybe only come into view in that sort of Owl of Minerva yeah. sense at the time of ending. I mean, we like anyone who's been around death knows there are often conversations that maybe it would have been better to have decades earlier that finally become possible once the reality of death has entered the room. And that's like part of my read on the times is, you know, we get to see and talk about things which it was a lot harder to see or to talk about even 10 or 20 years ago, like you say, even in the 90s. So I I end up by the end of my book with this kind of map, like back of an envelope map of four kinds of task that might make sense in a time of endings, where it's like, on the one hand, you know, salvage the good stuff that we've got a chance of taking with us from the wreckage. So, you know, I talk a few times in the book about changes in infant mortality over the last 200 years. I have a really strong memory of a few months after my son was born, just holding him and going, Jesus, like until very recently, no parent anywhere could kind of look into their face of their kid at that age and almost take it for granted that you're going to live to see that person grow strong as you grow old. And that's part of what the deal of modernity has given us. And so then it's like, well, how can you question progress if uh, (laughs) you you accept that? And I remember in my 20s, first trying to articulate these thoughts, getting really stuck, trying to answer those kind of questions. And in the end, it's like, well, wait a minute. What is the helpful thing to do with those kinds of achievements of modernity? Is it to bundle them up into a big story where everything is staked on everything else? Or is it to get granular and go, well, okay, what made that stuff possible? Like 25 of the 30 years of increase of life expectancy in the first nine decades of the 20th century in the US is down to public health, not hospital medicine. See, yeah. this is the, I, I didn't realize we had Illich in common, uh, oh, yeah. and I'm glad we do, <laughs> because uh, anytime people and it's it's coming back to the, this, I believe the science. Therefore, I'll get on an airplane. I'm like, first of all, the technology is more than a hundred years old. Second of all, that's an engineering marvel, and it's whenever modern medicine tries to 
lay claim to things from modernity that are good. I'm like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's uh, yeah, let's play the tape, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> because you might have antibiotics, but everything else, sit down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then what you've got is like salvaging the good stuff, like rescuing it, frankly, from the people who want to package it up into the Stephen Pinker story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it all gets absorbed under Fauci's coat that he only yeah. wears on TV because he's never had a patient. <laughs> so why he has a coat. <laughs> it all so gets absorbed. Like, what, what are the other right. kinds of tasks? The, there's you know, you, mourning the good stuff we don't get to take with us because there are going to be things, I'm like, antibiotics, looks like they're going one way or another anyway. Oh, and a lot of other stuff that's built on the stack on top of that. So like, mourn the good things that we have a chance of, uh, we, that we probably aren't going to get to take with us. And part of the work of mourning being to tell the stories, because those stories yep. get to come with us, and they might turn out to be seeds in worlds that we can't imagine yet. And then the third bit is the Illich bit. It's use this kind of owl of Minerva moment to notice the stuff and talk about the stuff that was never as good as we told each other it was about the ways we've been living around here lately. Yeah. I, yeah, it turns out Uncle Modernity was kind of a drunk. Like when you, when you, <laughs> you go, wait a minute. He was a violent drunk. <laughs> sure, he was great at Christmas, but yes, no, I couldn't agree more. And that's part of it because otherwise it does all get does all get lost. It's interesting. So in my shamanic healing training, we actually get trained on a technique called recapitulation um, at end of life. So you actually get trained on surfacing stories from people in last moments, last days or whatever it was life as, as part of a, uh, a required in an ideal situation, energetic change before someone leaves. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, when, when I heard those, ter that term hospicing modernity, I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> there's some work to do there. You know, there's some, and it is, as you say, sharing the the good bits, because the stuff that I will miss, I suppose, the thing that I think about is we haven't had a good movie in 20 years, give or take. Uh, good novels, they're also rare. I have this theory, and this comes back to the the technocratic borgification of all ideology, that there's actually only one book left alone, left in the world. There's two now with it work in the ruins. But our you know exactly the kind of bookstore, you haven't been to Fuller's in Hobart, but exactly the kind of bookstore that I'm talking about, which is the one that does author evenings and has the newsletter. And whenever the authors come to town, it's like the intellectual bookstore. But over the last 10 years, the only book that any of these bookstores sell is Michelle Obama's vegan cookbook of climate change. There's there's only one book and it is doesn't matter what the category is, it's this one identity, this one um, discursive position, and everything else is gone. Yeah, uh, everything else is a ruin, <laughs> right? And so the <laughs> stuff that I, the stuff that I want to take, is even if it's even if there are many points of intellectual departure or disagreement, I we used to like that. <laughs> we mm -hmm. we used to like um, dynamic culture rather than. Michelle Obama's cookbook of climate change, vegan cookbook of climate change. And that for me is the stuff I'm gonna miss. We used to do brave movies and challenging books and mm. not now. <laughs> yeah. All right, anything else about hospicing modernity? Because I think mm. that's an idea I want people to Well, I come suppose away the other with. bit is whenever Vanessa and the others from the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures Collective talk about this. They always go, it's like hospicing modernity and assisting with the birth of something new, unknown, and possibly but not necessarily wiser, and not smothering that new thing with our projections. And I yes. really like that, that formulation. Um, so, because sometimes the hospicing work gets kind of bound up with this sort of boomer tendency to mistake um the impending death of one's generation with the impending end of humanity yeah. um i that's why hospicing modernity it like, begins to place it back to the world as we've known it and our ways of knowing the world are not the whole story but then also putting it alongside the assisting with the birth of of something new and 
it was a bit from Vanessa that came back to me right when I was finishing the book where we'd had this conversation to mark the 10th anniversary of Dark Mountain. And she said, when I'm going out talking about the hospicing work, we often get to this point where people get stuck because they can't, they can't make a leap of faith because they're like, the idea that there is something new, something unknown coming after, they're like, we can't imagine that we can do it and therefore we can't believe in it. And she's like, why are you locating all of the agency with humans? Yes, exactly. It's, exactly. it's worse than that in like the rooms where the climate conversations happen, all of the agency is being located with a very particular subset of humans who are identified as the people who live closest to the future. And I'm utterly convinced that, you know, the things that turn out to make all the difference are not going to be coming from the people who gather in those rooms. They're going to be coming from places that weren't even marked on the map of those people because they'd been filed under, they were already in the past or they were too small to make a difference. Yeah. And this is its a big deal. We do a lot of this work with the premium membership too, because it's where people have mistaken the premises or claims of modernity as a, as a map for reality. And one of them is the the cosmology that thinks, because this is absurd, uh, and I don't care what anyone in climate science thinks, that you can, with a high degree of confidence, predict to within 0.2 of a degree the temperature of a planet in 100 years' time is bullshit. <laughs> it, is, it is steaming bullshit. And worse than that, it's people are unable to see that a a relationship to the future that is one of projection is part of modernity. And so yeah. what bio come what, what any of these uh, decolonial indigenous thinkers are trying to get people to understand is that's modernity. That idea that you not just know what has to come next, but it turns into a to-do list. That's what mm -hmm. got us here. <laughs> yeah. This is the process that got us here. And that's what you need to step out of. Your relationship to the future needs to reform around allowing other agencies to emerge. And in my case, I consider that to be spirits as well as, you know, plants yeah. and ocean and all the rest of it. But I consider it to be that. But it's, it, if anything, it's easier to tell people that. It's like, well, you live in a cosmos made of and filled with spirits. We're a very small part of it. Uh, just step into that because this is it's the leap of faith thing people are scared they're losing reality do you know what i mean because they, they they've mistaken modernity for for reality and so mm. when you try to tell them like have a different relationship to the future like put, put the to-do list away don't think oh yes but by 2040 or 2050 if we haven't all stopped eating beef then this will it's like what the fuck are you talking about like do you understand that that's a technocratic spell not that it, it and I, I use that word correctly because that it can happen. You know, you can cast a spell for it to happen. Yeah. But what's what's being called for is is to re-relate to a future that is not just the dictates and and wishes and fears of of human agency. It's it's everyone else, and it's really difficult for people to get. Like, do you have tips for people as to how to make that shift? Well. So part of the part of what's going on, I think, I mean, part of why people like Paul and Martin and so on are being called back into this relationship with God in a Christian lineage is because modernity's approach to agency is first we have to know the world as if we are God, and then we act yeah. from there. And you know, like you say, that's impossible. That's you know, that just leads you into a state of delusion. And so finding one way or another, a way of getting humbled, getting back to, no, in order to find agency, you first have to stop pretending or trying to be God. And then you can find a part to play within a story which you don't get to see the whole of. You know, yes. there's a lot of medicine in C.S. Lewis and in Tolkien and in their kind of magical ways of being with Christianity for that stuff. So then... I, how do you like, and, and it doesn't require you to sort of, this is the thing that we're up against so often is like, if you don't like this side, you have to be that side. Yeah. It's like, well, no, obviously <laughs> not. Like where are the, where are the hidden, where's the hidden consensus that's uniting the people who are fighting this loud culture war against each other 
that might be the bit that's really worth questioning. So like, people are afraid of like, going into the kind of questions that we might be talking about here because they think they'll have to end up joining them if they start <laughs> questioning what we as us are meant to yeah. uh, believe or take seriously. And so part of it is just like humor has to come into this. And Illich was great at, at that, at just laughing at the ridiculousness instead of joining in a po-faced serious conversation about something. So when we have, you know, I, this idea that George Monbiot and others seem to take very seriously that, you know, two billion people who are currently part of peasant farming households are just going away very soon. And one startup in Finland that can make you a pancake out of stuff grown in a vat is going to feed the planet. It's like the, the answer to that is not, I mean, yeah, like there are people like Chris Smage who can usefully get down into the data and give us the actual kind of sober explanations for what's wrong with the arguments we're being presented with. But the first yeah. answer is to laugh. And then to yeah. go, is it, how, it's what are the lenses the jet- through which we're looking at the yeah. world that make this seem like something to be taken seriously? This, you have to laugh. Like, and I was told years ago, particularly when it comes to powerful people and particularly technocratic powerful people, that's what they hate the most. Uh, it's I think why jesters were always so powerful, but mm. George, if he believes the stuff that he writes, mm. his worldview is stupider than the Jetsons and actually deadlier than the Nazis, but more importantly, <laughs> stupider than the Jetsons. Like it's the stuff, how he thinks Britain can be organized and fed is dumber than a flying car than fold, that folds up into a suitcase. And it's the same belief system. It is the same stupid, stupid mid 20th century modern technocracy. It's just so dumb. You read it, I because I, I don't read his stuff. I, I read all about that in a book that I wrote the forward for that Reid published uh, called White Deer, I believe. Yes. And talking about the vats of food and rewilding wolves onto British farmland that he and his guardian reader friends, I guess, can come and visit in a self-driving electric car on the weekends and then go back to eat the, the vat slop. You know, this is, what the hell? <laughs> this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's, you have to laugh. It's fun. It's, I, I would believe a suitcase car before I believed that. It's just, yeah. Anyway, that's good. I like that. So um, agency, humor, obviously read your book, uh, read read Hospicing Modernity. Uh, that's on my to-do list, that's for sure. I'll tell you what, even better, listen to Hospicing Modernity. I'm traveling tomorrow. I'll, uh, I'll get the Audible book and it'll be like doing the podcast all over again. <laughs> there you go. Nice one. Um, speaking of, what else you got going on? What do you got coming up and what do you want? This is, I, I got asked this when my book came out and it's a bit annoying. It's, it's a lot annoying, but I still want your answer, <laughs> which is what do you want this book to do? I, we just spoke about agency and not having it. And, and I've just asked you to project things into a future. I mean it more like, what do you want the book to do? What, what agency uh, do you want the book I, to have? If any? I want the book to give people permission to get off the sort of cycle of despair or desperate optimism that I see lots of people going through around stuff like climate change. I want it to make it possible for people who have been told they're on opposite sides to have fruitful conversations with each other. And like some of the most satisfying mails that I've had since the book went out are from people who are writing to me and going like, I never even believed in anthropogenic climate change, but there's a bunch of stuff in what you're saying that really makes sense to me. And I'm like, great. And that means you can also get into conversation with a bunch of other people who are reading the book who, you know, absolutely, you know, who include climate scientists who are saying to me things like, you know, how do we get away from the global story of climate exactly. change back down to the granularity of how these things actually work in relation to land and place. So yeah, I, I just hope that it gives people a bunch of stories and images and language that can help make some unlikely conversations possible. And uh, I mean, and then you know, we have this little school, a school called home here in this old shoe shop in this small town in Sweden and also 
extended through the wonders of Zoom and the rest of it onto the internet. So if people are like wanting to connect up more to the work and what we've been talking about and what I'm writing about in the book, then there are there are opportunities to get on board with that. So that's kind of, um, that's part of what's going on. And then I guess the things that I want to explore next are more into, um, like the, the book kind of ends with me saying, like surrender, but choose what you're surrendering to. Don't surrender yeah. to the certainty about how the story ends. That is a really like potent drug in some of the places that the climate conversations end up. Surrender to the mystery. And so yeah. I guess that's where I want to go next with what I'm writing is to go a lot further into the mystery and what that might, what that might entail and where that might, strange places we might find ourselves, the strange encounters we might have on that path. I love that. Surrender to the mystery. I think that's that's a really good, a really good, uh, really good take home. That's really good. All right, sir. Well, for people, obviously, I'm going to wave the book at them again. I work in the ruins. And for people who want to know more about this or the other stuff that you've mentioned, how can they get in contact? What do you got going on on, on these internets while we still have them? Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet because I've got a weird name. So you can just Google my name. Um, Doogle.nu is the homepage. A school called home.org is the school. And I'm also doogle.substack.com, writing a lot on there these days. So those are the best ways to come and find me. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on the book and, yeah, Thank fantastic you. conversation and all the rest of it. And, uh, yeah, speak to you again soon. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gordon.